Excellent. Okay, so uh, today we want to dive into a little bit of a different webinar style. So we're going to try to make this more interactive. Hopefully everybody saw that we asked for some submissions of uh, projects that you care about. And we actually want to do a live exercise to demonstrate how to use some of the uh, tools of design thinking to actually advance them and bring ideas to life. So uh, our goal really today is to demystify design thinking. We think about design thinking as a set of tools and practices to enable you to routinely innovate. Um, however, uh, in the recent past, there have become lots of jargon and uh, kind of big words associated with design thinking. So our hope is to make it simple, make it more accessible, and make it something that you can actually do in your work today. So. Um, our goal is to actually give you some practical tools that you can use to bring a product or service idea to life later today after you uh, leave this webinar. Um, our goals are threefold. Basically, first, to give you a sense that improvisation is a viable way to explore and to develop uh, product or service ideas. Second, to um, demonstrate the value in actually inviting someone from outside of your team or outside of your organization uh, into an improvisational or imaginary world to actually experience your concept, to further your thinking. And then third, to uh, demonstrate the value of being open to not only changing how you have conceived of your concept, but also how you are conceiving of the problem that you're working on. Uh, and the way that we're going to do this is we're going to tell a quick story um, about the value of improvisation and show you how it's practically been applied inside organizations. And then we are going to real time take a couple of uh, pro projects that you have submitted and actually uh, show you how we would think about improvising them and inviting in a stranger into our improvisation to explore. And we'll invite a couple of folks who are on the webinar actually onto our team to debrief the experience. So with that, we'll dive straight in. Great. So um, the story we're going to tell is actually about a graduate of ours. So the graduate's name is Tom Mayarama, and he works for a financial services company that actually makes um, financial software, software that helps you file your taxes and uh, plan financial matters and, and whatnot. And um, Tom worked on a design team there. It's a pretty, pretty good-sized company, so, so a large-scale company. And um, they were tackling a problem, and the problem was that um, a customer service problem. And um, on a on a phone system, when you call in here in the in the U.S. on an 800 number, that means it's a, it's a number calling in toll free. Um, what they noticed was they were getting a lot of complaints about a particular way that that interaction worked for the consumer. So people would call in, you know, hit number five and go to this service, hit number seven and go to this service, and what's your problem? And people were getting more and more frustrated. And they they were doing this design process that we teach at the B School and um, gaining insights and, and um, talking to the consumers and figuring out that they had a much better idea for how to route phone calls. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple stuff they thought about how to handle what we call a phone tree. So as you hit the numbers, where might you go? Okay? So whatnot and talk to them. ultimately the company sort of thought, hey, this is a good idea. We should do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and the usual thing is it's going to take a really long time. Right, six um, months, something yep. like that. Um, it's going to take a lot of money, mm -hmm. um, and you're going to kind of get one shot at it. So we can implement this, but this is kind of it. Right. And this would be the whole thing. But, thought, whoa, 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 but whoa, whoa, it's got to go before, yeah. before it could ever actually uh, see the light of day. It's got to go through legal. Mm -hmm. It's got to go through tax compliance, and it's yep. got to go through R&D. Yep. And then it's got to hit the customer service team mm -hmm. to get them trained. Yeah. So you've got to jump through all of these departmental hoops yep. before you ever actually see the light of day. So um, Tom... Um, being as, as smart as he was, and his team said, that's not really the intent. We're, we're actually not sure if this interaction is really going to delight the customer yet. We think so. We've done the interviews. We've, we've kind of done some really rough work. But again, we're at this stage we want to talk about today, which is, God, we really want to want to find a way to test it and experiment more rapidly than that. That's too high resolution, if you will. That's too much cost, too many people involved, too many logistics. So they tried something really simple. Um, they basically took a, a phone system, like what we have in front of us right here as we speak to you, um, and actually built out a, a phone tree on a script. So you can see on your screen, that's actually the script that, that Tom and his team had, and they elected you know, one person to actually be the phone system. So they actually role-played being a phone system. Right. What they simply did was they, they called up customer service and said, hey, would you mind routing a couple complaint calls to our conference room? To Just down phone? the hall. Yep. Just route a few. Just every few minutes, route another call. 
we promise we'll take care of them. And they, they basically followed the script. You can see on the screen. So they read through the script. So the person answered the phone, hello, you've reached so-and-so company, and hit one if you'd like to get service on your tax forms. Hit two if you'd like this. Whatever the interaction was, and actually went through it with the consumer exactly how they would have planned it with all of that programming, the six months of time. And as you can see, they sort of had a script and could easily cross things out, right. put post-its over things, change the routing, right. do whatever they had, and ultimately came up with a concept at the end for um, what I would say a, a concept for this phone tree that, that dramatically changed in this interaction over a couple hours, right. but was actually something they had a much higher um, confidence that it was delighting the customer and delivering um, what they intended on delivering. And what's, what's fascinating is what they learned through the process is that uh, the customer actually didn't care about the thing that the team thought they cared about. The team thought they were primarily concerned with efficiency and getting through quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, but as they actually acted out this interaction real time, what they learned pretty quickly was the customer actually cared about being heard and really feeling like the company was listening to them. Yep. And so whereas at the start they thought they were going to be implementing a system about efficiency, what they learned is they needed to be implementing a system to actually hear the mm -hmm. customer, which is a fundamentally different problem to be addressing. And they learned it really quickly rather than taking a long time to figure it out. Yeah, I think the so the, we're going to do a comparison now on that thing. Of the, this is the usual way, at least in the you know businesses I've been in. Certainly, um, we spend a lot of time planning, uh, um, a lot of time executing to to basically do kind of full scale um, prototyping. We're going to talk about something different today, but this is the usual way. This one, in this case, it was according to Tom, a half a million dollar project. It would take six months. There were many, many constituents and departments involved. You said legal, compliance, all this stuff gets involved. Um, it, and in the end, you launch sort of a fully resolved, um, but sort of unvetted, um, untested solution that, that may or may not solve the problem. And what we would propose is a different way of thinking, is using improvisation, as Tom did with his small team, making a small investment. Um, it was just weeks of time to get to the point they were um, clear about something. They used their design team. Um, and the key thing is they got to a concept that resonates with the end user and worth doing. So they had much more confidence to go out and actually say, okay, let's do, let's actually spend the half a million dollars. Let's actually do it and actually get all the departments involved because we're sure in the interaction, we're sure about the key things that are going to delight the customer. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about prototyping, there's a difference. It's, it's, um, I think of prototyping in my background as an engineer much more as prototypes as things. They're nouns. Physical objects. Um, what we would say is, is add the ing. Think about prototypes as prototyping. It's an act. It's about um, imagining that, as Tom did, imagine away all the technology. Imagine away there's there's all these departments that have been vetted. Imagine away all that. Let's actually make a system and actually see if the interaction actually delights the customer. And inviting your customers in, as he did, just routing calls in, just into this imaginary world. They didn't know that the technology didn't exist. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. What what mattered to that team was getting to the point they could actually figure out if if it would matter. Right, right. So to say it differently, um, the question early on, the question we're tempted to try to answer when we start prototyping is, mm -hmm. can we build it? Can we feasibly do it? And what we would say is that's actually the wrong question to be asking early. The right question to be asking early is not, can we pull it off, but would it even matter if we did? And if you can answer the question, would it matter if we did, and the answer is yes, then you can get into the feasibility question of how do we actually build it? How do we pull it off? But first, focusing on does it even matter? Does it solve a problem we're solving? Does it really address the need? Is That's the better question to answer. Because so many times it's so easy in your team to get into this echo chamber mentality and you think you've got a good idea and you, you end up funding and, and allocating resources to a project that actually doesn't. Uh, delight the end customer or even solve a problem that matters. Yep. So what we want to talk about today is how do you actually improvise in order to experiment, in order to learn whether uh, your idea actually matters, whether your idea actually solves the problem that you're trying to solve. And um, we're actually going to do this right now. We're going, to, we're going to practice using a couple of your live examples, and then we're going to invite in a stranger to actually get us out of our own echo chamber as we just sit and work through this. And then we're going to invite you to actually ask the, our strangers some questions and about how they experienced our improvisation, how they felt while they were interacting with our concept. Okay, one um, structure that we'd like to share with you as we think about improvisation, three things that are important to bear in mind. One is setting the scene. What is the context that you're in? 
So for every idea, every idea exists in a context, in a physical or virtual locality. What is that scene? Second thing is, what are the roles in the scene? Who are actually the players or the actors, the roles that need to be played? And then the third thing is, what are props or what are physical, tangible things that can bring the scene to life and make it a little bit more believable? So as we um, actually do our improvisation, those are three things that we think about, and then there are going to be three things we ask you to think about as you think about improvising as well. So we'd like to actually do it now. Uh, we'd like to use an example. The first example is... Um, Let's do the education software. Thank yeah. You. It's such an interesting problem. So the first example is from Sri Lanka. Um, Dorukshi. Dorukshi. Dorukshi, are you on the line? Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and do it. I think it's a great problem to... To demonstrate. Yeah, I, I really like it too. So we'll read what, what Dilrucci submitted. Um, so uh, Dilrucci said, our university has a tool for supporting online learning, but students always complain of the lack of interaction. Students don't feel that it's, they don't feel that they're real or natural when studying. I want to increase the collaborativeness as a natural habit in a system where students feel alive and a desire to use the system. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dilrucci's idea is, um, I want to make students and teachers feel as natural as possible to collaborate with each other in a system. Okay. Great. So as we think, so let's let's play okay. this out real quick. We're going to do this now. Yeah. So we're um, actually going to improvise, and then we'll invite a stranger in to to role play with us, and then we'll take questions and comments about what we see here. So we're going to create a, a world where this our concept already exists. All right. Should we? So start? scene prop roles. Okay. So scene. So. So students and teachers, so okay. maybe you could be a teacher, I'll be a student. Okay. Um, and we're... You're, it's homework, so it's homework, right? That was the situation? Right. Well, it's just, it's about collaborating real time, feeling like you're actually in here. We should okay. Make sure yep. Um So let's see. So if you're, if you're a so teacher... So to know, we have really simple materials, just some paper pens here. Okay. Post-it notes, pens, aluminum foil, et cetera, simple things like that to help us as we think okay. about what props we might need. So if you're a teacher and I'm a student and we want to interact, how can we facilitate an interaction here? So I'm wondering if it's, I just go to online, because they talked about a technical tool. Okay. It's an online trans, you know, online thing. Okay. So you're doing um, math or something, like some math homework. Right. You're doing math homework. Right. You're having trouble. Okay. We yeah, interact, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, okay. Um, what do you say? It says so more natural. If we're virtual, maybe let's turn around so we, are, so we okay. can actually see each other, right? Okay. So, so I'm... Say I'm I'm doing my homework yep. and I'm 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 uh, okay. I'm struggling on number five, right? So, um, you know, can I yep. get these coasters here? They'll okay. search my phone. Okay. So, am I calling you? So, uh, uh, ring, 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 ring. Okay. Um, hey, hey, um, student, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, professor, I had a question um, about uh, number five in the in the homework. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm at I'm at home. Let me just get to my desk. Okay. Yeah, what's your question? I can see my you know what? my e homework now. Okay, even as I'm doing this, I'm feeling like uh, it's an imposition. It doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel like I should I feel like I need to just send you a message. I'm available, I'm at home. Right. So like you that's a pretty high load for Well, and I would say, say like, I would also say I don't really want to ask you, honestly. Like as my yeah. teacher it's like student Jeremy. Now, yeah, now weird. now all of a sudden it's um I I I I've, I've shown you that I don't know the material. Right. Okay. So I kind of wish, so maybe what we should do is figure out how to facilitate interaction between students. Okay. Okay, so we could, maybe we could, we could be students right now, but we're both, you know, if we're both working on our, you know, laptops okay. or something. Um, so if we here, here, this will be your laptop, this is my laptop, right? So we're both, we're separately working. Okay. Um, so I can see maybe on your screen something pops up. All right, here's a note that says... Oh, so like it's an IM or something. Yeah, so I like am say, hey, I'm man. doing my problem set right now. It just means that we're doing our problem set. Oh, like I'm, I'm currently working on my problem set. Okay, okay, I'm here, I'm available. So we've got... Oh, thing. okay, so so, the, so then the idea is we just check into the homework room, so to speak. So like we check in... Okay, so we're going, we here's your check-in. Check you're okay. checking into math. Okay. So you've checked in. There's math. Yeah. Minus math. Okay, so we're both checked in, and we're just do, we're just jamming. So like we're we're doing it. So let's actually let's let's try to do a math problem. Like let's uh, five so factorial. It's, it's, yeah, five factorial. I don't know. <laughs> this is Stanford. Be careful. <laughs> 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 five okay. times four is twenty times okay. three is sixty times. Okay, I'm confused by factorial. I'm but what's, I'm confused by factorial. Oh, I see. Jeremy is on his math homework. 
you know, ping. I can ping you and say, are you doing factorials? Like a chat window. So you could so you could pull up a chat window. All of a sudden, it comes up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I'm what I'm wondering is, <clears throat> what if we're just what if it's almost like a, um, I know when I travel, for example, this is random. When I travel, like sometimes my wife and I will just we'll just have FaceTime up and we'll just mm -hmm. be doing something, and then we're like, yeah. hey, did you see this? What What if we're just live? We're just actually live, and mm -hmm. because it's not what if I'm sitting here? So so we're quietly working. Yeah. Right? So you're just working. Okay. Doing math homework. Writing down things. No, quietly working. This guy. Okay. Uh, hey, has anybody done number four yet? Yeah, I've done four. Hey, uh, walk me through. I'm on the third step here. Okay, so uh, what, what did that feel like to actually, all of a sudden, I just interrupted you? It's, I think it's, it's this idea of checking in. If I've checked in, that's where I'm still back on. I think that's a, we figured out a key feature, which is if I've checked in, mm -hmm. You know, um, I think it's I'm now available. I've right. flagged them available. So if, if you're I want in, you're time, willing to. Oh, okay. So yeah. that's a social covenant, and you're willing to take questions. I think it's a good idea. And also okay. maybe, um, what if the what if the teacher? So now I'm back in my role. I'm teacher again. Okay. I can see who's checked into my class and who's helping. So there's something I'm looking for students to help other students. Like I'm oh, watching for who's helping. So you could actually kind of maybe so reward students feel like it's part of the culture of the class. Or facilitate a connection. Yeah. To get this natural collaboration he's talking about, which I think is the intent. Okay. So what do we need? So if we're going to invite in a stranger into this, to, so I can still be a student, you can be the teacher. What I think, do we need? To, I think to I could be a life? teacher, but I think I need to be the tech. The technology doesn't matter. We can right. make now all this stuff could be programmed or done or right. whatever. Right, right, right. I'll be the technology. I'll literally okay. in inter I'll be the computer, if okay. you will. Okay. That's fine. So, and then um, what do we need to be able to bring this to life? Can we just, do we do we need a math problem or something for us to go? We need a math and problem, and, and I think that the person needs a, let's call this a laptop. Okay. Okay. They need a laptop that's so. their interaction. And they need um, a check-in window on their laptop. Okay, so I've given a really hard math problem. Okay. which I think is unsolvable, uh, and we can, have our, we can have a stranger do it. And then the question is, are they willing to ask for help? That's, a, that's what I want to know. Okay. Are they willing to actually ask for help? Great. And I'll be doing, I'll, I'll, and this is their, la is that their laptop? Yep. Maybe you just put this problem beside it. We can have them Great. there or something. Okay. Okay. So we gotta, we got to invite in. Be right back. Okay, let's bring in a stranger. Okay, do we want to set the scene? Yeah. Right here. Okay. okay. So, Tom, so you and I are both in the same class. Okay. We're both in a math class together. And we have an idea about um, doing homework and us just logging into, like, a virtual chat room, and we can help each other if we need help. Okay. okay. Oh, so we're, so we're not together. No, we're, no, no. So, you, so you'll sit over here for a second. Okay. You sit over you go here. right here. here. So yeah. Down here. And I'll sit here. And we're not. So, oh, okay. we need a wall here. Let's, I'm sitting on our wall. So this is wall. We can't see each other. That's your laptop. It's my laptop. Okay. So here's this is a laptop. Okay. And I'm the I'm sort of the internet, the technology between you guys. So you're in math class. You just got a really hard assignment. If X means this, then Y means what? And Perry, maybe you you're maybe, confused. Maybe you have a um, like there's an audio kind of like a you know Jeremy just logged on and is yep. available for questions or something. So okay. So am I, am I in my dorm room or am I at home or? You're at home. I'm at home. Okay. Okay. You're working on your homework and you've checked in to okay. math because that's part of the class and you yeah. check into the system when you're working on it if you're available for other students. Okay. Okay. So I'm working on a math problem. So here I'm a I'm a message to your computer. Okay. Hey, I'm Jeremy. I'm working on math. I've checked in. I'm having a little trouble on the really big problem. X equals if X then Y equals whatever. I'm, a, I'm confused. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I think if 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 I know, so now you're do I know this guy. I think yeah, if I know class. Jeremy, then I'm like, okay, I might. Help okay. Him. So now you're. So connected. do I see? Okay. Yep. yep. You see Jeremy? He popped up and said he's available. Okay. Hey, man. Uh, how did you find out what the kitten is in in uh, problem number four? Oh. Um, well, so you have to like you have to calculate the um, how many hairs are on the kitten first. Oh, and that's this. That's where that. That's uh, where the factor. That's where the hairs per square inch. That okay, I got it. I okay. didn't think about that. <laughs> Squares per square. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, can we pause? Can we? Okay, so let's break from this for a second. Yeah. Let's actually break from this mm -hmm. team. Um, I kind of wonder whether I'm cheating. Hmm. Because you got the problem. Like, why would you like? So, like, I, I, when I was in, when I was doing engineering, uh, if I was in my dorm room doing a problem set, it'd be totally fine to like turn to a neighbor and like ask, like, oh, what, what did you have on this one? How'd you find that out? So I don't see a difference. To me, I don't see a difference between that and doing it online. Got it. So okay. As long so you as aren't it, worried. I think it has more okay. to do with what the expectations from my teacher, maybe. Okay. So as long as it's okay for us to collaborate, then I think it's. I like the idea that I can kind of check into this. So like you said, I checked in and I found yeah. that Jeremy came in, right? Yep. That like, when when I'm doing my homework, I can kind of just log on to the system, and when I'm stuck or when I want to ask a question or if someone needs help, then I can interact. Yeah. I think it's okay. Okay. What, what is it about that that you like, though? So you like checking in. If you were just, if it was, if you were always checked in, that's not okay. You you like that you checked uh, in. Well, I mean, it's really it's more relevant when I'm actually working on it and yeah. my head's in that Got zone, it. and I'm not okay. like I don't want Jeremy to call me when I'm when like, you're working on lunch. Oh, or right. Like, okay. Yeah, going to the gym. Okay. Yeah, going to the gym or you know. So there's some, so there's something yeah. about so one thing getting to this net. Uh, Dil Rushki, one thing she mentioned was uh, getting into what's the natural. Um, yeah. When is it natural to collaborate? And one thing that's apparent to me is when you check in, you're saying, I'm in homework mode. Yeah. So it's not that you're always on or always accessible, but it's you. every every person has an ability to kind of signal when they're yeah. in yeah. homework mode. So that's yeah. a key difference. So let's break. In the, in the prototype, what we're learning, so Thomas is teaching us, is actually the modality is kind of important. The, the context is important for this. Mm -hmm. Is If you're in the mode of doing math at the same time, and in that mode, like, I'm actually struggling with this problem, and he's maybe five minutes ahead of you, mm -hmm. he's actually willing to help. But if he's already on to history homework, it's like, yeah, I want to walk into math. Side line. Yeah. So, okay, so maybe there's, there's class-specific logins. My yeah. computer, I dropped my computer. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you mentioned when you were in college, you, in, in, when you were studying engineering, you would go to somebody else's dorm room. How did yeah. you kind of make or that decision? Or like a common space, or... Uh, oh, or a common space. Okay, so tell us about that. Well, how did, like, how did you actually do homework? And share and work with people. So when when I was in college, usually the the homework set was hard enough that it was very hard to finish by yourself. Like you, unless you were like the top ten percent of that class, it was really hard to finish that homework. So you mm -hmm. almost needed to collaborate to like figure it out together. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I mean, it, it, I could see. I'm just thinking about this. Is like if people are not together, like this. There were times when it's like I didn't start my homework till like midnight. And no one else was around, and then right. I'm stuck, and I can't. I can't. I can't finish it. I literally cannot finish the homework because I just don't know how to do it at that point. And you've waited till a point when, oh, so what if, so then that makes me think, what if there's like a coordination feature where you can say, like you can, you can ping the group and say, hey, when are people going to do homework? Ooh. So you can get, so you can basically ensure yeah. that you actually, um, you have a study buddy, so to speak? Yeah, that might be, so it's kind of yeah. like reservation. your own, like working time together. Right. Oh, like a homework reservation system. And you don't have to be in the same place, but you're virtually in the same place. I mean, that's, that's true. Like, if I had three days to do this math homework, the likelihood, depending on how big the class is, the likelihood that someone else is online when I'm online, it's pretty low. It would be lower than if we said, okay, like 7 to 9 p.m. each night or whatever, 3 mm -hmm. to 5 p.m. Yeah. That's the time when you, it's a good time for you guys to get online. Either, yeah. either it's, it's told by the teacher or maybe we can make an agreement, mm -hmm. student to student. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder. It'd be cool to student student because maybe I bet mm -hmm. he doesn't know my schedule. So right. we figure out when we want to both be online. Yeah. The time. Right. So there's a couple of things that I feel like we're learning here. One is about uh, subject, the context of the person's life is important. Are they in the, are they mm -hmm. in the headspace? Yeah. Well, not, only, not only mm -hmm. studying headspace, but subject-wise headspace. Yep. And then the, and then the second thing is um, if you want to create the, you know, serendipity requires a little bit of coordination. We can't, it's, it, 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 we can't just have an system where hopefully somebody's on. If you're in a, if you're in a do or die situation like you're talking about, we actually need to enable you to make sure you can connect to other people. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any it other questions? Kind of like encourages there? me to, to start before the midnight. No one's going to be online anymore. Okay, so say more about that. Why, why is that important to you? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's like if I'm if I'm procrastinating and I get stuck, that's bad. But if I know if I start earlier and I can get help with a friend, that encourages me to start earlier, which is probably good, and it allows me to collaborate. So that yeah, I mean, so like there's two bonuses there. 
The, so say the bonuses again, just like so Well, know. one is that, that I start earlier, so I don't procrastinate as much because I know I'm going to be working with a friend or working with someone I might know. Oh, so there's some kind of accountability. Yeah. Okay. And then and what's the, the second, second is that if, if I, just the fact that I do get to collaborate with somebody else, then I don't, I'm not going to get stuck and not know how to finish the homework. One, okay, so, so last question I have for you on this, and, there, and then I think we should actually break frame and, and ask for questions from the mm -hmm. webinar folks. Um, how did you know who to ask for help? So in your engineering, you mentioned only the top 10% of class could finish. How do you make decisions about who you ask for help? Hmm. You know, when I really think about that, actually, I mean, the logical thing would be get with the student that's the smartest or that's the best at that subject. But okay. I mean, it usually wasn't that. It's more like if I had, it's more like the friend that I had that I would work with. So if I already have to have some sort of relationship with that yeah. person to sit down and like, do the math homework together. Yeah. Okay. So I wonder if that says something about like the online. If the class is entirely online, then maybe I have to do something to help people connect in the first place. Or if there's an in-person component that they get to know each other before they get separated. Right. Or why? I don't. Why are we thinking them mutually exclusive? Well, it could be online, offline. It could be choose your adventure, right? Your reservation could be booked for. I was just thinking about like enable being able to help somebody. You only have to be one step ahead, right? So like, what if there's like a status update? Mm -hmm. Like some kind of system yep. to, to, to externalize where you are, mm -hmm. because if you like, if, if so, say for example, I'm on, you know, I, I'm through number three, yep. right? And you can, that's a backwards three, but you get the idea, right? You can see that and you're on number five, yep. you immediately know, yep. you, you know you don't need, like I'm not the person to ping for help, right? Yep. But if you saw Perry's on number mm -hmm. eight, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. What do you think? So he's got an eight on it. You're, you're, you're now a student. Yeah. He's got an eight. You're stuck on number five. What, and, I, and I have a three. What do you do? Well, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that he, if he's ahead of me. Although, if I know you better, I might. I, so I like the idea yeah. I know where you are. But if I know you better, I might still say, hey, will you skip again ahead to five with me? Uh, and work okay. With me? Okay. Okay. Because you're more comfortable. Yeah, I don't, like, yeah, I don't is, vulnerable, is you vulnerable? Are you feeling like you I'm don't not, want to share with I'm me? Probably don't not. Answer? Probably not going to reach out to you if I don't know you very well. Okay. But if I know you, I'm like, hey, you want to work on five together? Right. So yeah. It's actually more important for me to know you or like, uh, feel like and I'm work on it you. together. Yeah. So rather like, than tell me what you did. Yeah. It's not feel like, oh, you already figured this out. Tell me the answer. So that's an interesting thing. It's about it's about enabling uh, cooperation, not kind of bumming answers. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think it makes more sense. I, like, if I'm constantly asking, yeah. like, tell me your answer, tell me your answer, tell me your answer, then it's like... But also, it also may be a, 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 a good insight for, for our friend in Sri Lanka is it, what I hear Thomas saying is it has to leverage something that got built in the classroom, meaning if he didn't get a relationship with you before, it doesn't matter what the technology is if he's really having trouble. Right. It, it good. What is the class for and what is this tool for? The right. class is to build that rapport so they can actually get leveraged over a right. technology link. Because what I heard him say is like, I'm not going to, smartest, I'm the smart guy in the class. Right. Yeah. Um, but you want, you're not going to ask me because you're intimidated unless we work together on a problem set maybe in class, like we've been working together. Well, so then, oh, yeah. so then, so then the question, the systematic, the, the systems question becomes, um, what are mechanisms for mm -hmm. personal connection in class to enable a more natural online right. experience? Okay. So we actually, so part of the challenge, it sounds like, for uh, our friend in Sri Lanka is actually um, cultivating a social environment that would make mm -hmm. people feel comfortable enough to interact online. Yep. I think that's actually a okay. great, huge insight. So let's break, let's break frame okay. and talk to the audience about what we're doing. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Here, I'll walk in there real quick. Okay. So let's talk about, so, in that prototype, what I think is um, interesting to show in terms of the techniques of breaking frame and talking about process, in our process, um, what I love comes out of it is it's almost like by doing it, we figure out, we, we, well, first of all, I want to back up. We did not worry about technology at all. Right. There's, we varied between things that looked like they were complicated to implement to easy to implement. And I want to sort of say to the audience that that's part of the point is we assumed a way we could program this. We assumed a way we had a budget. We assumed a way those things to figure out if, like what you said, if it, if we did all this stuff, would it matter? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think by doing that, we move beyond the stuff that holds you back so much with this, with the idea of uh, making a prototype. They got to make a mock-up. I got to do the technology. I got to figure mm -hmm. out how much it would cost before I show my boss. Right. Because the first thing you're going to say is that expensive, right? We explained. We said, oh no no, let's not do that. Right. But we got to a couple of key things. I didn't were unique to me. One is 
um, this idea that relationships get leveraged, mm -hmm. not built suddenly, not instantaneously right. built. Right. The trust is something that needs to get well, leveraged. Well, and a virtual interaction is supported mm -hmm. by a real trust. Yeah. yeah. So that was, to me, a key mm -hmm. thing that came out of this. Is mm -hmm. The role as an instructor to leverage these tools became really interesting mm -hmm. of how do I actually make it so this, that, how do I make the conditions that collaboration would happen out of the classroom? Mm -hmm. That's what my job becomes if I'm this, this teacher in Sri Lanka. Right. All right? We're going to talk about how we test. We, yeah. We, have, we wrote down a couple thoughts. So as you think about uh, improvising and inviting a stranger in, uh, we wanted to share a few thoughts. Is this good? Yeah, okay. Um, for how to try out your concept. So the first thing is actually invite someone in, into your world, right? So you think about um, what we actually did, right? We just said to Thomas, hey, we're in class together, right? Suppose we're in class together and we're both doing math homework. So we, yep. we immersed him as quickly as possible into the world and we gave him a little bit of context, but that's it. But then the second thing is we actually improvised with the new person as part of the scene. So it wasn't Perry and I, we weren't doing a play and asking Thomas to be in the audience and watch and then clap at the end. We actually invited him in as an actor in the play and we were real time improvising based on some of the things that he said. And then the last thing is, after we have that interaction, specifically want to talk about how it went. Mm -hmm. and, and the talking about how it went, there, there are two important steps to this. So the first is obviously, as we lose those pages, first is obviously talk about how they experienced what we set up, right? So what was it like to actually do the thing yeah. that we thought we were doing? But then really quickly, hopefully you noticed, we actually went beyond our prototype and started saying, hey, you mentioned when you were in, in engineering school, you studied with people. How'd that go? And right, we started talking about his real world because in the end, part of our concept is actually it's a way to understand people better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a pretty big shift in frame to think about a concept not as your goal necessarily, but it's a probe to learn about other people and to learn what works for other people and, and to actually allow people to inspire and evolve your idea. Yeah. I also think the, the, the posture we took as we interviewed them was not a one of um, defensiveness or trying to validate our concept. It was one of um, being willing to change and iterate on the fly and actually try things out with them and the goal being to learn more about them and their conditions and I think that's what made it a richer experience for the first round of prototyping. Right. Right. Having kind of a, I would say, um, so do we want to take some questions now? Yeah. Is that so possible? one I saw pop up was, um, how do you do this kind of thing with a really complex product or process? So it gets way more complex. This was a, a student sitting with another student, I have a question on homework, which, you know, I would say one of the things we do as we do this type of work is, you know, a complex process is, is picking sort of key pieces of it. What do you think, the question I would ask yourself is, what do you think is the, the most important uh, port, important part of that interaction for the user? Right. And try to just focus on, even if it's 30 seconds. Right. Even something, because it's a place to start. Meaning that if you back up and try to make all, if we tried to figure out how does the teacher load the system, how do they enter the people in, how do they actually um, log in, how do they actually, there's a lot more to this idea right. than what we did. Right. But we decided not to do that stuff. We decided right. just to focus on the magical Boom, there's one button. Oh, we explained the way, you know, I don't know if in Sri Lanka they can even have left. There's, a, there's enough resources in the school to give people a right. technology device. I, I don't think know. If I had to distill what Perry's saying, I, I think that the essence of it is if you have a really complex idea, ask yourself the question, what is it you're actually trying to accomplish for the end user? What's the emotion maybe you're trying to produce or the, or the um, reaction you're trying to cause? And ask yourself the question, what about my concept is what element, what aspect of my idea is going to be most responsible for delivering that um, emotion or that experience, and then bring resolution to testing that. I think uh, to, to root it in our example, we said we thought um, help in a time of need, right? There's probably, there's, if you think about online learning, there's all sorts of aspects of that, right? Mm -hmm. Testing and all sorts of things yeah. that we said. Let's assume that the most critical part of this is help in the time of need. Then we brought we, we create a need, and then we actually brought resolution yeah. to the interaction in that moment. And it assumes away a ton of complexity, right? A ton of technology. It assumes we both installed it, we both know about it, all that mm -hmm. stuff. But we're able to actually have an interaction yeah. on that very specific element. And so, the more complex the system, the more the more I think explicit you need to be about what the hierarchy of emotions you're mm -hmm. trying to create is, and what elements of your system are going to deliver on those motions, and then isolate them yep. through simple improvisation, through simple tests. And I, I think what you saw is um, 
we did not figure that stuff out in advance. We figured it out during the interaction, even before we invited um, the outsider in. You and I were saying, that isn't going to work. This is going to work. This, we had an instinct, right. so, but the point is starting. I think that the, one of the biggest pieces of advice we would give about prototyping is starting and actually diving in and beginning to do it because it doesn't become clear to us that the issue of context, the issue of sort of relationships in advance, all those things came out of the process. If we were to do another iteration now, we would actually move and I would say move to a higher resolution. We, in this, we might use a Google Hangout and actually prototype it on a Hangout mm -hmm. and actually have people interact by right. a few laptops. We might put right. them in different rooms right. so it's not so awkward. No need to create yeah. new technology, right? Yeah. You, can all, you can use things that already exist in order to test interactions because at the heart of it, it's about that mm -hmm. student interaction. And there's a lot, like you could set up a FaceTime call, you could do a Skype call, you yeah. could do all sorts of things. But the, the bottom line is, will students use it? If students use it with your rough and scrappy, you know, 80% solution, then it's worth investing the yeah. money and time to actually. Exactly. And what we've taken is the first step. What we're showing you today is demystifying again. So we're taking the first step into prototyping. One of the other questions I see is, okay, we picked a simple context. We're teachers. We chose teaching. Right. What about something like, there's a question on here about, what about the medical field? What about when you have patients, hospitals, administrators, waiting rooms, rules? You know, are you just going to assume away that stuff? Hmm. You know, I'd say... You know, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. You've got to get down to, there's a few ideas we had we don't have time for today about patient interaction right. and improving patient action, improving, one of them was improving sanitation in the hospital and these types of things. And the answer is you've got to get down and begin someplace, and you begin with what we'd say, begin with this simple idea of improv mm -hmm. which are seeing prop and roles. And if we wanted to create a patient room, we might make this the bed, we might do something, mm -hmm. and not worry so much about all the regulations and all those things, because we're going to assume a way, we're going to, we're going to figure out and get through that, we're going to try to figure out if the particular, in the case of medical, the patient interaction is actually worth doing. And we'd actually begin to prototype and actually make that interaction and create this imaginary world that we could invite somebody into. Try to, I'm looking at the rest of the questions. Um, so Ryan, I think we've got... One? So we have about 10 minutes left. Yep. Uh, do you have a few more slides if you wanted to, to wrap yep. up a little bit, maybe some of the, the, the key learnings? I know you've gone over a lot of them, mm -hmm. but if you wanted to just to summarize a few sure. of those, I'd appreciate it. Sure. So let's see. So um, for us, I think if we had to say why, why prototype in this way, um, one thing that hopefully has become clear even in this one example is it's about uh, learning more, not about validating. Early on, especially this is about early concept testing and early concept development, it's really easy to believe that we have the right answer, and the question is, let's just, let's execute. It's only a problem of execution. We believe that oftentimes the, the failures in industry, commercial failures, are because they weren't answering the right question, not because they have the wrong answer. And so early concept development is, is as much about learning. Do we have, are we answering the right question? Are we solving the problem we're solving, rather than, uh, testing and saying, you know, uh, the amount of times we hear somebody say to a customer, no, 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 you don't get it, or you aren't doing it right, is astounding, right? And that's, that's not the attitude to have. If they don't understand it, if they don't get it, it's because there's an opportunity to increase the, um, your, your level of understanding of your customer. Um, and then the other reason is it's, it's about failing early so, so that you can fail cheaply. Right? There's, there's immense savings to be gained in, in uh, identifying the right vector early on rather than blindly marching down a path uh, of de a development and, you know, in, in the example from Tom, um, involving a bunch of departments and an idea that, I mean, internally everybody thought it was a great idea, right? And, so it's, and, and they had approval, so that's great. But we involve a bunch of different departments, we spend a bunch of money, and then we, we generate a concept that maybe it's a great concept, but it doesn't actually address a problem, rather than really scrappy and really quickly um, improvising and, and creating a world as if, the, as, uh, creating an imaginary world where the idea supposedly already exists in order to learn, does it actually solve a meaningful problem? And then if it does, yep. putting the funding and resources behind it necessary so that you can have confidence and you've, and you've really reduced your risk early on. So I got, I got a chance to look at the question feed. So I got a couple of really good ones to so get a chance to focus. We got a Great. bunch of screens up here. The one was um, somebody noticed, hey, we got suggestions for solutions from our user. And what do you do with those? Are you supposed to accept them? Or are you supposed to not? You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I read the clip, but I think to me it's a really good example of um, something pretty important, which is natural as humans to to jump right to a solution. I want to jump right to a solution. Oh, my God, we should have the website. Oh, my God, the teacher should do this. Da, 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 da. The, 
as um, our user came in and sort of gave some suggestions, even at one point I remember you doing this, you, we asked them, that's really interesting, and take notes and respect their opinion and, and write down their, their solution, but ask them, what would that do? Hmm. What, what does that do for you, what do you imagine? You? Yeah. you know, what was, when he said, I wouldn't call number eight because I want this, but I think that's a cool feature. It's like, great, that's cool, right. writing down, right. but what would that do for you? Hmm. And I think that's a, that's a great question and actually something we didn't cover that well is hmm. solutions are, are welcome and invited, and they are such an amazing invitation to ask a question. And right. the question is, what would it solve for you? What is, what are, chances are you're missing something that's emotional to them that they want to fill in the gap. Um, and the great thing about it also is if you're getting solutions proposed by your users in these improvs, it's probably a, a, a good indication you're doing this right, mm. um, which is we are low enough resolution, they're understanding what we're doing right. and, and willing to help and contribute. Right. And that's kind of the culture of prototyping you want to look for is is get your user to actually almost feel like they're co-developing a bit, like mm. they're they're contributing their ideas, they're contributing a bit of themselves to it. They're actually, you know, sort of this whole thing's propelling itself forward. Yeah. No, I think I I, I um. There's something about when when the when the user's actually submitting suggestions. Uh, it, I think a great kind of misnomer with human-centered design or design thinking is mm -hmm. it's about asking our users what they want. Mm -hmm. And that's not that's not correct, right? There's a great Henry Ford quote, if yeah. I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. It's not about just taking marching orders from the customer and blindly following them, but it's rather about enhancing the interactions you have with them. And then it's still your job as a designer, it's still your job as an innovator to actually go beyond what is suggested or what's stated to actually understand yep. and uncover the unmet need that maybe they can't articulate. But there, as Perry said, their solutions will hint at. And solutions that your customers suggest, you still have to do the work of saying, wait, what would it do for you if you got that? And then you as a team may know, wow, there are five other magical ways we could deliver that that they don't know to suggest. But now that we understand yep. the need that's underneath it, mm -hmm. we could deliver on that need. Yep. Um, and the other one I really like is, um, what if, your, what if your solution just straight up doesn't exist? The thing you want to test is it doesn't exist. They were saying, what if I was making a beverage and the beverage just made you happy? Like, what, how do I test something that I truly can't make? We, we sort of alluded to it here with, um, we didn't program a single thing yet. We had a technology solution. Mm -hmm. You sort of explain away the technology. But if you're, I would say actually more so than anything else, if your solution can't exist um, and you don't see a quick way to sort of make it, it's actually even better to, sort of create the circumstances where it could exist. Imagine that it does exist, and actually sometimes um, we give the user some context. Um, or, you know, it's, it's um, you know, for example, if I wanted a beverage, I might say to the user, like, let's, let's take a, if you'd be willing to, let's jog around the building for a, a minute, then I'm gonna give you a glass of water. Right. You know, so it's right. create a circumstance where it's, it's, it's not the perfect, if you wait for perfect, you'll never get there, right? right. It's the classic learning of life. It's, you're never going to get there. You're never, the perfect circumstance to create that improv. But how can you happen. create it, right? How can you get, yeah. the, like, like um, if you want to create anxiety in somebody, or you want to you figure out how to relieve anxiety, do something that creates it, right? Like, take their wallet and, like, and like pull cash out of it. Now they're worried, and then you bring in your, your uh, intervention, right? Or, yeah. or I remember a classic story from the D school of uh, students who really wanted to understand how, uh, in, how, uh, how a concept impacted people who are really antsy. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say, okay, pretend you're antsy. So what yep. they did is they just invited people in to like, a, uh, they, they had them drink a bunch of water. Yep. And then they just had them sit and talk for a long time. And then when they needed to go to the bathroom, before they let them go to the bathroom, they, they had to interact with the prototype, yeah. right? And all of a sudden it's like, I am antsy, so now I can learn about this, right? Yep. So there are ways that you can, there are alternative ways that you, that you can actually create the desired state mm -hmm. for then your concept to, um, yep. to intervene into. Um, and the other one, it came up a, a few different ways, this idea, there's, there's confidential information. So what if my idea is secret or what if there's information um, that, is kind of hard to use, or it's or it's personal information. And I'd say we we've done things in in all different areas, whether it's medical. We talked a bit about medical, so I want to shift to financial services. So financial services, you can't just um, I, I I can't pull up Jeremy's four hundred one k account and say, oh, let's actually test a new interface. Right. Uh, wouldn't be that that would that's confidential information. It's not going to work. But what it can do is say, explain that sort of again, sort of explain that away. Like I don't want to worry so much about that. If I'm testing a certain interaction. How would I test that with a with a piece of information maybe that matters to Jeremy or a piece of information about his daughter or something that that it or or truly just mock up um, 
a, a fake interaction, if you will, but but explain to them, give it the, the load. Like, what if this was your your little daughter's um, college account? Right. You know, let's just make up numbers. It has right. two thousand dollars in it. Just putting dollars is, down on the is, table. Yes. And do something to to create the financial interaction. Right. And then we can sort of put you in the mindset to talk about you know dealing with personal information, dealing with personal um, financial decisions, and right. actually create the interaction. Right. One thing I would say is people are they're way more willing to um, interact and give information about themselves than you would expect. And so it's kind of an amazing thing to, once you get somebody, I mean, even our experience with Thomas, right? He just walked in and all of a sudden he's talking about his strategies for studying when he was in college. And really quickly, if, if you have an open attitude and it's not about you're wanting to you know, uh, maliciously use this information or something, but you have an openness and a, and a, and really a graciousness, you'd be amazed at how willing people yeah. are to engage. So we've all we've reached the one, one more quick, one more question. Actually, Last one. Give me a okay. and flip to your next slide. Okay. I, think it's a, I, want, I want people to see that one because um, I think it's probably yep. what you're talking about. Go ahead and we'll, we'll get your last one, and then maybe we'll wrap okay. up after that. The last one I want to say is a, a question just came through that I noticed is I'm on a team with a bunch of technical people, and the conversation always goes to technical. Hmm. And I think it's a um, – we didn't talk a, a much about how this works in the team. So you've heard us out. You're going to get these materials. Um, the concepts are, are, we hope, very straightforward and very accessible to something we teach at the design school, which is how to experiment your way forward and get moving. And the answer is what do we do about team dynamic? And I, the answer I'd say is – Inviting in an outsider, a, a true stranger, a user, really can help teams get beyond their sort of day-to-day -day working and realize it's about the interaction, it's about delighting this person, and we've got to get beyond where we are. Um, and if the coders sort of in your team want to sort of come back into code, we need to start programming something, we need to, right. this needs to be an interaction, you know, start with what we talked about is, is get them to like, let's figure out the interaction even matters. Mm. You know, there's a total number of hours, let's actually figure out with our users. So that might be one where, you know, the, the conversation we had at the beginning is, is invite a user in almost immediately. Right, to, before you're ready. Break it. It's yeah. like don't wait until the team's ready. Do it before the team's ready because that's when the information is actually useful in determining your team's direction. Before they fall back to their old behavior, which is let's write a piece of code. Let's figure something out. That's what I want to use with the user. Say, make it almost impossible. I've almost invited the users in. They're coming in in five minutes. Okay. Let's figure out the interaction. Then maybe we'll do a coding session later. All right. What if there's already funding grants and expectations to develop a concept yep. using an old method? I, I think, so I like that. Uh, read the question. Yes, there's a question. What if there's already funding granted and yep. the expectation is to develop a concept using an old method and the design thinking approach to prototyping is not established within the organization? How do you change the, how do you change the approach to being within an active process? I would say this is, uh, I'm curious to hear what Perry had to say. Yep. My, my two cents is it's a great first step to really quickly infuse some life and energy into a project. So it's highly complementary to your old approach, right? At some point, you actually have to implement and execute, and most organizations are really structured well to do that. The question is, are you implementing and executing an idea that's exciting and invigorating and meaningful? And to do that, even if you spend a short sprint, right, a couple of days or a week early on using an empathetic and a prototype-driven approach, um, just, as, just as a way to kind of break open your thinking. And then you even just um, you, you funnel it straight into your current implementation engine. I think that you're bound to get much better results. Yeah, and I think um, to me one of the sort of the, the organizational change pieces is if what matters to your organization is also getting it done efficiently, I would argue some of these tools used early on are efficient. We learned a lot for two people times, um, I think we took 25 minutes or so to 30 minutes, so an hour of total working time, we learned, I thought, two major things about um, this concept for a um, educational tool that might be incredibly useful to, to, to move forward with. And I'd say that's the attitude to take is it's one of these tools can help us be way more efficient. Um, I don't think it's, it may or may not unravel actually using the old technique. It, it, it could be that there's some parts of the old way that, that or the project that's ever been launched that are terrific, and it might just help redirect it. And I think the other thing we see about um, bringing design process and good um, design mind, mindsets into companies, it's a function of cycles. And I think this executive that, that has this project that already has old technology and already sort of uh, expectations mounting, to realize 
there are going to be so many different opportunities to use design process if you if you want to implement this kind of thinking and not to put all your eggs into one. Like, this one's got to be amazing and I've got to get breakthrough results. This one might just flip a few of your team members to using these techniques. The next one, we might come up with a, a really great concept. The third or fourth time, we might finally get that breakthrough. So it is cycles, and that's what we see over and over and over with executives coming out of our programs or students is it's, a, it's fluency with the cycles. It's building a team that can actually routinely innovate using these tools is the key. Excellent. Okay, so uh, today we want to dive into a little bit of a different webinar style. So we're going to try to make this more interactive. Hopefully everybody saw that we asked for some submissions of uh, projects that you care about, and we actually want to do a live exercise to demonstrate how to use some of the uh, tools of design thinking to actually advance them and bring ideas to life. So uh, our goal really today is to demystify design thinking. We think about design thinking as a set of tools and practices to enable you to routinely innovate. Um, however, uh, in the recent past, there have become lots of jargon and uh, kind of big words associated with design thinking. So our hope is to make it simple, make it more accessible, and make it something that you can actually do in your work today. So. Um, our goal is to actually give you some practical tools that you can use to bring a product or service idea to life later today after you uh, leave this webinar. Um, our goals are threefold. Basically, first, to give you a sense that improvisation is a viable way to explore and to develop uh, product or service ideas. Second, to um, demonstrate the value in actually inviting someone from outside of your team or outside of your organization uh, into an improvisational or imaginary world to actually experience your concept, to further your thinking. And then third, to uh, demonstrate the value of being open to not only changing how you have conceived of your concept, but also how you are conceiving of the problem that you're working on. Uh, and the way that we're going to do this is we're going to tell a quick story um, about the value of improvisation and show you how it's practically been applied inside organizations. And then we are going to real time take a couple of uh, pro projects that you have submitted and actually uh, show you how we would think about improvising them and inviting in a stranger into our improvisation to explore. And we'll invite a couple of folks who are on the webinar actually onto our team to debrief the experience. So with that, we'll dive straight in. Great. So um, the story we're going to tell is actually about a graduate of ours. So the graduate's name is Tom Mayarama, and he works for a financial services company that actually makes um, financial software, software that helps you file your taxes and uh, plan financial matters and, and whatnot. Whoa, 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 but whoa, whoa. But it's got to go before, yeah. before it could ever actually uh, see the light of day. It's got to go through legal. Mm -hmm. It's got to go through tax compliance, and it's yep. got to go through R&D, yep. and then it's got to hit the customer service team mm -hmm. to get them trained. Yeah. So you've got to jump through all of these departmental hoops yep. before you ever actually see the light of day. So um, Tom, um, being as, as smart as he was in his team, said, that's not really the intent. We're, we're actually not sure if this interaction is really going to delight the customer yet. We think so. We've done the interviews. We've, we've kind of done some really rough work. But again, we're at this stage we want to talk about today, which is, God, we really want to, want to find a way to test it and experiment more rapidly than that. That's too high resolution, if you will. That's too much cost, too many people involved, too many logistics. So they tried something really simple. Um, they basically took a, a phone system, like what we have in front of us right here as we speak to you, um, and actually built out a, a phone tree on a script. So you can see on your screen, that's actually the script that, that Tom and his team had, and they elected you know, one person to actually be the phone system. So they actually role played being a phone system. Right. What they simply did was they called up customer service and said, hey, would you mind routing a couple complaint calls to our conference room. To just down the hall. Yep, just route a few. Just every few minutes, route another call. We promise we'll take care of them. And they, they basically followed the script you can see on the screen. So they read through the script. So they first answer the phone, hello, you've reached so-and-so company, and hit one if you'd like to get service on your tax forms. Hit two if you'd like this. 
whatever the interaction was, and actually went through it with the consumer exactly how they would have planned it with all of that programming, the six months of time, and as you can see, they sort of had a script and could easily cross things out, right. put post-its over things, change the routing, right. do whatever they had, and ultimately came up with a concept at the end for um, what I would say a, a concept for this phone tree that, that dramatically changed in this interaction over a couple hours, right. but was actually something they had a much higher um, confidence that it was delighting the customer and delivering um, what they intended on delivering. And what's, what's fascinating is what they learned through the process is that uh, the customer actually didn't care about the thing that the team thought they cared about. The team thought they were primarily concerned with efficiency and getting through quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but as they actually acted out this interaction real time, what they learned pretty quickly was the customer actually cared about being heard and really feeling like the company was listening to them. Yep. And so whereas at the start they thought they were going to be implementing a system about efficiency, what they learned is they needed to be implementing a system to actually hear the mm -hmm. customer. Which is and um, Tom worked on a design team there. It was a pretty, pretty good-sized company, so, so a large-scale company. And um, they were tackling a problem, and the problem was that um, a customer service problem. And um, on, a, on a phone system, when you call in here in the, in the U.S. on an 800 number, that means it's a, it's a number calling in toll-free, um, what they noticed was they were getting a lot of complaints about a particular way that that interaction worked for the consumer. So people would call in, you know, hit number five and go to this service, hit number seven and go to this service, and what's your problem? And people were getting more and more frustrated. And they, they were doing this design process that we teach at the B-School, and um, gaining insights and, and um, talking to the consumers and figuring out that they had a much better idea for how to route phone calls. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple stuff they thought about how to handle what we call a phone tree. So as you hit the numbers, where might you go? Okay? So whatnot and talk to them. ultimately the company sort of thought, hey, this is a good idea. We should do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and the usual thing is it's going to take a really long time. Right, six um, months, something yep. like that. Um, it's going to take a lot of money, mm -hmm. um, and you're going to kind of get one shot at it. So we can implement this, but this is kind of it. Right. And this would be the whole thing. Well, 